نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونسترشده ونعوذ به من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله الله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون أما بعد أيها الإخوة الكرام يقول ربنا تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المبين ولو شاء ربك لآمن من في الأرض جميع كلهم جميعا أفأنت تكره الناس حتى يكونوا مؤمنين Indeed all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator, the sustainer and the controller of all that happens in the universe We praise him and we thank him for his blessings and his mercy We believe in him and we put our trust in him we seek refuge in Allah from the evil inclinations of ourselves and from the evil of our actions. Whoever chooses guidance, there is none to misguide him. And whoever chooses misguidance, there is none to guide him. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah. He is one and he has no partner. And I also bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the servant and messenger of Allah whom Allah sent with the religion of truth and with guidance so that this truth and this guidance will become established in the land over all other ways of life although the idolaters detest that my dear brothers and sisters this time of the year is one of the few times when as parents we become very concerned about the future of our children, in particular about whether they will be able to retain their Muslim identity in the future. Because of all that's happening around them at this time, the Christmas season, and the fact that they're bombarded with so much information about Christmas, that quite often they want to or ask, why don't we celebrate Christmas? And as parents, of course, we take steps and measures to protect them from the harm of being convinced that it is okay to embrace such celebrations. But the question is, how much do we protect them? Or how do we ensure that they would grow up in this type of environment and society and still when they become adults and grown-ups they will have strong Muslim personalities on the one hand many parents tend to overprotect their children and in as much as this overprotection may work well for a period of time in the long run, brothers and sisters, it can actually do a lot more harm to our children. Because it does not enable them and allow them to learn the skills necessary to survive when we, the parents, are no longer there to protect them. So the dilemma we face as parents and as adults and as community leaders what is the best long-term solution in terms of nurturing our children and our youth and our young people so that when they grow up not only do they function well in their society but they also are responsible Muslims they are conscious of their duties before Allah the exalted the creator of the heavens and the earth they're conscious that as Muslims they have to submit and surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how do we achieve that 
Do we lock them up? So, so that they are not exposed, period, to the many things that are happening around them in society? Or do we set them free without any restrictions, without any limits on how they interact with what's happening around them? Or is the solution something else? My dear brothers and sisters, as Muslims, we not be afraid of the various celebrations that occur in this country, in Canada, in particular in Toronto, because we live here. Because these are wonderful opportunities, I believe, for you and I, as adults and as parents, to engage our children and our young people in terms of the realities of these celebrations while at the same time enabling us to offer them the Islamic perspectives. These are very good opportunities. If you try, brothers and sisters, to talk to your child about Christmas in August or July, see what happens. Try that and see what happens. It would not work. They would not want to listen. Your message will not get home. Because the mind is occupied with other things. But at Christmas time in the month of December, when there is all this hype in the, in, in the society and in the media and in television about Christmas and whatever else, the, the mind is more receptive. And this is all part of the wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders us to use as we begin to teach others about this religion and this message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he said, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah, invite to the way of your Lord with wisdom. With wisdom. Selecting times and, and opportunities when a person might be more receptive, more open minded to what you have to say than at other times. We need not be afraid, brothers and sisters, that our children will be influenced by all this, the bombardment of all this information that they're receiving about Christmas and other celebrations. Because the best way to protect them is not to overprotect them or to put up walls around them so they're shielded from what's happening in society, but rather to engage them in discussions about what's happening in society. If you are afraid, brothers and sisters, of your child drowning, you can either lock the child up at home and ensure that he or she never ever goes near water, or you can give the child swimming lessons. Now locking the child up at home, never ever going near any lake or any swimming pool, may work for a time. But maybe one day this child will find himself or herself in water. And what happens then? The child may drown. Whereas if you teach the child how to swim, the child could still drown, of course. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of his universe. So even the best swimmer can drown. But nevertheless, as parents at least, you will have that peace of mind knowing that your child knows to swim. They have learned how to swim. So the fact that they're in water is not that scary for you. So the best solution, brothers and sisters, is to equip them with the skills necessary to survive in the situations that they will face as life unfolds for them. If we give them the skills necessary, inshallah, they will survive. If we teach them how to swim, inshallah, they will be able to save themselves. They won't drown that easily. But if we don't teach them how to swim and they end up in the water, then we have contributed to their doom. So this is the time, brothers and sisters, rather than being worried and scared, that my child will begin to learn love Christmas and want to celebrate Christmas 
and want pres presents and gifts at Christmas time. This is the time we need to engage with them. Talk to them. Ask them questions. Let them express their feelings. And if you and I, brothers and sisters, if we celebrate Eid, and only a few weeks ago we celebrated Eid al-Adha, and two months before that we celebrated Eid al-Fitr, if we celebrate Eid, and we make it memorable for our children, they will not be enticed by all this talk around Christmas time about gifts and exchange of gifts and giving gifts because they have fond memories of Eid. But if we didn't celebrate the Eid to the point where it, it's memorable for them, then of course, they're going to feel that pull and attraction of Christmas. So what is important for us as parents and as adults, brothers and sisters, is to educate our children about these issues. Because when they grow up and we get old or we pass away, we won't be there to protect them. They will have to make choices for themselves. And so the training and the nurturing and the discussions that you have now with them will go a very far away in helping them make the right decisions and choices later on in life. And this, I believe, is the best way, perhaps the only way, to truly ensure that our children grow up and, and develop strong Muslim personalities. That they, they are not confused about their identity in this day and age. They're not confused as to whether they're Canadian first and Muslim second or Muslim first and Canadian second. And this is precisely what the Prophet ﷺ did with the Sahaba, brothers and sisters. He did not keep them cocoon in a little community in which they had no contact with non-Muslims. In fact, only five years after Islam came on the scene in Mecca, five years only, after Islam came on the scene in Mecca, the Muslims were few in number. But they were tortured and they were persecuted by Quraysh. What did the Prophet ﷺ do? He encouraged some of them who could do so to migrate to Al Habasha, to Ethiopia. This is a country that's far away. You have to cross the sea to get over there. And on top of that, it was a Christian country at the time. A Christian country at the time. And the Prophet ﷺ recommended and encouraged the Muslims at that time, in face of the persecution they were faced with, to migrate to this place. A country that's so far away, and in those days, it was not possible to pick up the phone and call and say, Oh Prophet, we have this problem. What do you advise? That was not possible. There was no email that you could send in those days. Was the Prophet ﷺ sending these Sahaba, these early Muslims, to their doom, so to speak? Putting them in a Christian country, in a Christian environment, when contact with him is almost impossible? It was impossible to happen on a very quick basis. It will take a lot of time. No. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ was not worried that in this kind of environment in Ethiopia that the Muslims may be tempted to revert from Islam. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ taught them the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these Muslims who went had enough education, enough nurturing from the Prophet ﷺ to be very strong in their identity. And this is why eventually when Quraysh would send Amr ibn al-As and another individual to try to convince the king of Ethiopia and Najashi at the time to expel these Muslims and send them back to Mecca. He told, Amr ibn al-As told Najashi 
when all other attempts failed to, to convince Najashi to send back this group of Muslims, he played his trump card, as we say. He told Najashi that these Muslims, they hold a different opinion about Jesus, peace be upon him, than you have. And he thought that this would result in a, a Najashi expelling the Muslims because of a difference in belief. So an Najashi asked the Muslims to tell them, to tell him what they believe about Jesus, peace be upon him. And this is when Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the brother of Ali radiallahu anhuma, would step forward and he would speak and recited verse, verses from Surah Maryam in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives many details about the life, the birth of Isa alayhi salam and his life. The Prophet alayhi salatu was salam sent this group of Sahaba over there without being fearful or afraid that they may become corrupted by the environment in which they live. Why? Because they learned the message of Islam. And once you have that, no matter what, what environment you find yourself in, inshallah, you'll be able to survive because you have the skills necessary. So this is the time, brothers and sisters, a wonderful time for us as Muslim elders and parents and adults to really engage our children and our young people in discussions about Isa alayhi salam. This is a wonderful time for us to bring the Qur'an and let them read for themselves Surah Maryam. I am sure, brothers and sisters, that our children and our young people would find it very interesting that an entire chapter in the Qur'an is named Maryam. An entire chapter. There is no other chapter in the Qur'an that is named after the Prophet's own wives or his own mother. Alayhi salatu wasalam. The Prophet's own wives, nor his mother, or anybody else, no surah is named after any one of them, but a surah is named after Maryam, alayhi salam, the mother of Jesus, alayhi salam. I believe our children and our young people would find it very interesting to learn that the name Muhammad. The name of our Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, the final Prophet and Messenger to mankind, is only mentioned four times in the Qur'an. While the name Isa, the name of Prophet Isa alayhi salam, is mentioned 25 times in the Qur'an. I think our children will find it very interesting to learn that the name Maryam the, the name of Jesus' mother, alayhi salam, was mentioned 20, uh, 34 times in the Qur'an. 34 times in the Qur'an. I think that our children, brothers and sisters, will find it interesting that the title of Isa alayhi salam, al-Masih, the Messiah, is mentioned 11 times in the Qur'an. This is the best time in the entire year that you and I have to teach our children at a time when they are receptive, mind you, <clears throat> of the reality of Jesus, peace be upon him. And to also teach them about the Christian perspective that he is the Son of God. And to engage them in discussions as to why he is not the Son of God or anybody else for that matter. This is how, brothers and sisters, we ensure that our children, when they grow up and they become adults, that they have strong Muslim personalities and identities. That they're not confused about their identity by engaging with them now about these issues and providing them with information from the Quran so that if ever they engage their own friends in schools in such discussions, they don't feel embarrassed because they have nothing to say and they don't know the answers, but that they're able to engage in discussions, in debates if you like. They're able to make their case in as much as other people may not agree with, the, with, with, with that or not, doesn't really matter. But at least 
they know who they are and what they stand for. They know what they believe about Isa alayhi salam. In fact, even their Christian friends would find it very interesting to know that Jesus' name alayhi salam is mentioned 25 times in the Quran, while the name Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam is only mentioned four times. They themselves find this very interesting. They themselves find it interesting that as Muslims we believe in Isa alayhi salam and we believe in his miraculous birth as the Quran mentions. They think we don't believe in Isa alayhi salam. We believe in him. But as a human being and as a great and mighty messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not as the son of God, or not as someone who is part God or God himself or having divine qualities and attributes. We need to explain these things to our children. And in Surah Ali Imran and Surah Maryam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a lot of details about the story and the life of Isa alayhi salam and his mother, Mary alayhi, alayhi salam. Let us sit with them, brothers and sisters, and, and take the Quran and read these stories for them and with them, and give them a chance to ask questions, or ask them questions, let them think. Let them give you answers. This is how we educate and we train them. This is how we give them the skills necessary to survive, to, to make the right choices and decisions when they become adults and they're on their own. It starts now, and it starts with engaging them, allowing them to express their views and opinions, correcting whatever might be incorrect for them, giving them advice, giving them guidance, and also, very importantly, producing the proofs and the evidences from the Quran and from the Sunnah. This is what we need to do. So we need not be afraid of these times and these celebrations and try to cover our, the eyes and the ears of our children so they see nothing about Christmas or hear anything about Christmas. Let us engage them on this issue of Christmas. What's its significance? What, what is it today as compared to its original significance? And by asking them these questions and pointing out these things to them, they become well aware of the realities of such celebrations. And in fact, they themselves, brothers and sisters, will make up their own minds that indeed, this celebration is not a big deal. We don't have to force them to do that by just giving them the right information. By engaging them in discussions, they themselves will make up their minds. So the key here is education, it's knowledge. This is why the very first word that Allah revealed is Iqra, read, learn, educate yourself. Because with knowledge, you dispel all superstitions, all superstitious beliefs and practices. With knowledge, you know what you're doing. You have a very solid basis to stand on. Because you have knowledge. You're not unsure. You're not confused. Your way in front of you is very clear with knowledge. And so after only five years of Islam being on the scene, how much do you think those early Muslims could possibly learn? Only five years. And they had to learn in secret. Quraysh could not find out that they were meeting or else they would take steps to, to end that. And yet the Prophet ﷺ was not afraid that they may lose their Islam in Ethiopia. And we know from the tarikh, from the history that they didn't. We know, in fact, that eventually an Najashi himself, the king and ruler of Ethiopia, would become a Muslim. So when he died, the Prophet ﷺ in Medina prayed Salat al Janaza for him. So let us, brothers and sisters, make use of this wonderful chance that we have these days to talk with our children and to engage with them on this issue. And when other celebrations come up, we should do the same. Because this is the time that they are hearing a lot in school. They're probably exchanging gifts with their friends and their classes. Their mind is, is tuned in 
to, to, to the celebrations. So let us use these opportunities as opportunities to engage with them, to talk with them, to explain to them the Islamic perspective, to research the origin of these celebrations. Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter. Let us research with them the origins and the basis of these celebrations so that we can point out to them the Islamic perspective so they can compare. Telling them that this is on Islamic is not going to do it for them. Because when they run into their Christian friend, this is on Islamic is not a convincing answer. They, we make our children feel embarrassed to engage their Christian friends in discussions about these matters. Because they have no information to offer. They are not even firm about where they stand themselves. We make them embarrassed to want to talk religion with their friends. Not that the, the, the goal is to go and, and, and make Muslims out of anybody else. But at the very least, they should not feel ashamed or embarrassed to engage their uh, Christian friends or non-Muslim friends in discussions about certain aspects of religion. Because in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it clear that not everybody would believe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَآمَنَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كُلُّهُمْ جَمِيعًا If your Lord will, everybody on the earth, all of them would believe, without exceptions. أَفَأَنْتَ تُكْرِهُ 